Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Dr. Donna DeCarolis, founding dean of the Charles D. Close School of Entrepreneurship at Drexel University and Silverman Family Professor of Entrepreneurial Leadership. Donna, welcome to the show. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. Now, you've been involved in academia your whole life, or for professionally speaking, and I guess before professionally speaking, for that matter. So when you were on the other side of the desk way back when, I'm curious, back in high school, what was your favorite subject? History. Any particular history was kind? was my favorite subject. It was actually my, my major uh, history and education. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share with, with the viewers a secret. My goal then was to teach history, particularly the Renaissance, uh, to high school students. And when I actually had that opportunity, it was a very bad experience because my expectations of uh, the receiving audience were not there. You know, teaching high school is a whole other uh, experience. So I, I switched my career path to uh, business consulting, ultimately getting a PhD in, in business. So you we were teaching high school when you were a high school student. Did you also like history best? Yes, yes. That's what pro propelled me to, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach high school to high school students. And when I had, the, I lasted a year in the classroom and said, this is not for me. <laughs> yeah. so. Every, every, uh, I think, Teachers are inherently genetically wired to be right for a certain age group. And, you know, my father was a was a middle school teacher for 40 years, and I yep. was always trying to figure out whether he should be canonized or committed. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, after a year teaching high school, I was leaning more toward committed, which is why <laughs> I um, switched to get my MBA, my PhD, because I always love being in the classroom. Yeah. I always love teaching. It's, it's, I always say education changes the world. And so I think it's very important. Uh, I just switched my topics and my audience. <laughs> and now that you've shifted into this higher education world, who do you need to influence now in your current leadership position? So Laura, in, in the current leadership position, there are probably three groups, if you will, that I need to influence, not in any particular order. You know, the first would be, um, I'm really the voice of the Charles D. Close School of Entrepreneurship. I am the voice. So I need to influence my customers, incoming students and parents. Uh, and I need to convince them of the significance of an entrepreneurship education, of its value. I need to convince them that entrepreneurship is more than starting a new venture, that you need to be the entrepreneur of your life. So that's one group. Uh, the second group that's very important for me to communicate to in, as a dean would be my, my, steam, my, my staff and my team uh, to continually energize them, inspire them, keep them focused on our mission. And the third is um, university leadership and donors. You know, mm -hmm. uh, this is academia, but you know what? I'm always selling, uh, trying to get support, either financial, or in terms of resources, or just in terms of buy-in. So uh, those are sort of the three groups that I need to continually influence. Sure, and I would think that the donors would be particularly challenging nowadays in, in with COVID and all of those, uh, the ripple effects there of everybody's fighting for those kinds of donor dollars. Yeah, that's for sure, that's for sure. The, I, th I think the good news about my message of entrepreneurship being a mindset is a lot of people can relate to that, particularly today, and the importance of that resilience and that innovative mindset. Then what's the biggest communication challenge that you or the school is facing today? So related to what I just said, I think the biggest challenge really is how do we make the Charles D. Close School a household name, synonymous with entrepreneurship education. Because while the big message for us is that an entrepreneurial mindset can be developed, we can take someone and through 
courses, through experience, because entrepreneurship needs to be an apprenticeship, right? Through that experience, we can develop their mindset. Um, that's a big message, right? But it's also a nuanced message. You know, mm -hmm. how do you do that? I get, I get the pushback. You know, can you teach someone to be an entrepreneur? I get that a lot. Um, you know, and my response is, you know, we teach people to be doctors, we teach them to be lawyers, we teach them to be leaders. The way you do that is a combination of, you know, the academics, the courses, but also the experience. You know, as I like to say at the close school, um, you know, we have a course ready, set, fail. You know, what's it's the importance of failure. You're going to come here, you're going to fail, not your courses, you're going to fail in starting something and we're going to pick you up and you're going to learn to pick yourself up and jump back in again. So the, the big communication challenge, I guess, is really the big message that we have, but it's also a little nuanced. Sure. Then what specific skills did you have to develop in order to get this across or, or in order just to be successful where you are? I mean, you founded this school. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I really did have to work on this skill. It was the skill of persuasion. Hmm. And what I, so initially, and we have to, to understand that I was with the close school, I was really breaking a paradigm, right? Because entrepreneurship is always taught in the business school. So I would get the raised eyebrows. What do you mean? You know, the entrepreneurship is not in the business school. I would go to conferences with my colleagues from universities, you know, around the, around the States. What do you mean entrepreneurship is not in the business school? And so I really did have to work on honing my skills of persuasion. And as I think about it, for me, being persuasive is really about how do you be authentic in your message? Because people can feel that. Uh, how do you um, uh, communicate that passion and then roll that up in credibility? How do you make your message credible? So I'm, I still work on the persuasion skills. Um, and I think that's that's probably the most important thing that I have learned. And I think, to be honest, I wasn't good at it initially. I knew I had this great idea for a school of entrepreneurship. I knew it was necessary, but I really had to work on convincing the other um, of its value because it was so outside an academic paradigm. Then what's one big mistake that you made or a lesson you had to learn the hard way in the process of this whole learning curve? So the biggest mistake I made was has to do with persuasion and not being persuasive enough. And I found that the mistake I was making was talking to people about the importance of entrepreneurship, the importance of the way that the close school taught it uh, more as a mindset together with business skills and not getting them involved in the conversation. And mm. so I found that when I told a story and asked for their input about what an entrepreneur is, then all of a sudden they understood, oh, I understand what she's talking about. Mm. So that's, that's something that I've learned that is very successful is to tell the story. But for me, I guess being the professor, the teacher in me, getting the audience involved in that story. Sure, sure. Get, and the more you ask the questions and using a little more of that Socratic approach. Yeah. Terrific. Then yes. <laughs> what's the next big goal yeah. for you then, for, whether for you personally or for the Close School of Entrepreneurship? And what skills will you personally need to continue to develop in order to reach it? So I, I think that the, the next big um communication goal for me uh, in terms of the close school is continuing that message of the importance of an entrepreneurial mindset. And uh, believe it or not, uh, you know, this pandemic has given us an opportunity. Uh, and so the opportunity is life throws you curveballs. And the value proposition of the close school is you know, life doesn't always go your way. How do you manage your options? And I think that's the platform. It's it's the next big, it's the next big, um, actually it blends with our continuing message about developing resilience, developing initiative, developing how do you negotiate? All of these things become even more important now with the pandemic, with unrest, with uncertainty. It, it really cries out for people to develop that entrepreneurial mindset. 
So it's almost a, an opportunity to practice what you preach. Life has thrown this curveball, and now the school has to get really entrepreneurial and figure out how to Absolutely. serve its students under well, these. You know, all of us do. The students do. They've they've pivoted to virtual learning. We've all pivoted. We've pivoted to working from home, uh, but we have to we have to do this day by day and and just hang in there and manage your options and in the spirit of that challenge this brings us to the listener 24-hour influence challenge so donna this is your chance to talk to the to the audience directly and give them one step challenge them to take one step that they can complete in the next 24 hours to have more influence for themselves how would you like to challenge our listeners today so here's the challenge uh, I'd like the listener to think about something that they really need to convince someone else of, either a subordinate or superior, someone personal in their lives. And we always say, put yourself in the other person's place, but that's very generic. Mm -hmm. What I would like, and this is, it's difficult to do, put yourself in the other person's place, but what assumptions do they have in their head about what you're about to say? So I'll give you the personal example. When my platform is entrepreneurship education is really about developing the person, I know what's in the assumption the other person is making is entrepreneurship is all about business. And I need to, to break through that assumption. So I think it's important for listeners to try and think about not only the other, their audience in terms of maybe demographics or where they are in the, in the, in the organization, but also about what are what what are they coming to the table with? What assumptions do they have about the message you're about to give? All right, everybody. So you've got some homework now. Sit down and think about it. who are you going to persuade about what, but the prep you have to do is to jot down some points for yourself about the assumptions. Get into their head. What assumptions are they making about you or about your pitch, about your idea, and prepare to counter that, right? To to Yes. And, and if I could... Them. If I could just add to this, please. This is really uh, something that we teach in the close school. If you've ever heard of the lean startup methodology, it's mm -hmm. questioning the assumptions that you have about your business, your product, your process, and how do you how do you de-risk those assumptions? So it's all part of that entrepreneurial teaching. I love that expression, de-risk your assumptions. All right, everybody, that's your entrepreneurial mindset tip right. for the day as well. De-risk your <laughs> assumptions. Now, this brings us into more how you run your school, how you how you are overseeing the whole program. And when you think about terms like executive presence, whether it's for your students, for your staff, for your faculty, otherwise, how would you define it or otherwise, how would you identify it in others? How do you know it when you see it? So here's, here's how I would define executive presence. I mean, sure, a lot of it is about appearance, how you look, uh, you know, first impressions, but I find when I'm really engaged with a speaker or with someone that's speaking directly to me, it's somewhat of a, I, I want to say an oxymoron. It's a powerful type of calmness. It is the speaker that is really getting across to you, but they're, you know, they're not moving their hands and their voices and up and down. It's, it's a very firm calmness, a mm. powerful calmness. To me, that is executive presence. Uh, I was, if, if, if I could share uh, something I watched on PBS last night, there was a gentleman, I think his name was Brian Stevenson, who is a strong advocate for those who are incarcer incarcerated um, wrongly. And this gentleman um, had, was, uh, had such strong executive presence in a very calm way. His message was so powerful. He was so authentic. And I think that's something that I would continually strive for myself is believing in my message and getting across in a, in a, in a self-assured way, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the importance of my message being, being, and it being powerful. All right. So then I'm in trouble. I'll have to sit on my hands from <laughs> if the hand motions are are part of it. Being I think being in, in control of those is right. no, well, well, yeah. right. That's always my challenge. Then with regard to succession yeah. planning and grooming your high potential employees or looking to hire, to promote, to uh to give someone tenure even. 
what are, aside from all the other, of course, 10 years, a whole other ball game, but nevertheless, with regard to moving people up and hiring, what are the three most important communication skills you look for? Uh, someone that gets to the point, mm. someone who is passionate and someone who can communicate their credibility. Those are the three things that I look for. I, I mean, I've thought about this, you know, uh, someone that sometimes that gets too much into the weeds that digresses, that's going off on tangents, not sticking to the point. Um, I, I, they've lost me. You know, someone who is, well, I talked about powerful calmness, right? But someone who has that calmness, but yet still exudes that passion about what it is they can bring to the table, what it is that they want to do, how they can add value, that's important to me. And when I say credibility, what is it in the past that you have done? What are things that you can do that show me that, you know, you, you, you do bring validity to this position uh, or to advancing your career. So th those will be the, the three things. Okay. Then on the flip side, what's a red flag? What could be a, a career derailer or otherwise convince you, mm, no matter how great this person seems technically, I don't think I can hire them. <sighs> this is easy. Obvious bragging and name dropping. Hmm. I can't tell you how many times people have come into my office and they're just there, uh, to impress, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're rattling off their LinkedIn followers and, you know, oh, I know this person and I, and they just casually drop these names all over the place. That to me is such a red flag. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the red flag, the obvious, and, and the obvious, um, not only the name dropping, but the too much of the puffing up of themselves. Mm. Okay, so I want to dig a little bit here because one of the big questions that I get a lot, I end up doing a lot of interview coaching and things for people, whether they're interviewing for a job or otherwise. And one question that a lot of people, especially women, tend to struggle with, and also those who come from certain cultures, Eastern cultures and, and uh, some other places where humility is viewed as being a, a paramount, then Where's that line? How do you self-promote? You mentioned in, in the previous question, as far as skills you look for, you said the ability to communicate your, your credibility and your and to, to promote yourself in that way. But where's the line that you don't want to cross between going from promoting yourself in that communicating your credibility aspect into self-aggrandizement? Where does it become bragging? And how do you draw that line carefully when you're yeah, the speaker? Yeah. And, and so I'm glad you bring that up because that Right. Thank you. And because that's something I've struggled with as a woman, uh, always being taught, you know, to, you know, stay quiet, um, subtly, right, which mm -hmm. has changed a lot now. But so, yes, um, I really do think it has to do with explaining uh, in a non in a non ego showy kind of way what it is that you have done and to be confident in that. So much of, of what we bring to the table and how I even will um, interact with others is about my own confidence. And I think you need to develop that confidence before you go for a job interview, before you ask that promotion, uh, while you're networking. It's, it's the self-esteem, it's the confidence issue, which is very different than bragging, mm. right? And I and, there's a fine line there. I, I hear what you're saying, but you have to become comfortable with saying, yes, you know, I increased sales by 20% where I was without that sounding as though, you know, you're, um, you know, you're, I don't know. You, you, there's, there's just a fine line there. Uh, I'm sure. not sure that I'm answering your question, but I, I do think it all stems from confidence. A lot of communicating is particularly about who you are and what you can do. Even my message with the close school mm -hmm. was really about confidence. As I mentioned before, I think in the beginning, I probably wasn't as confident as that message because this was so new. This was so disruptive. And I knew I was going to get pushed back. And so it took me a while uh, to find my voice, if you will. Yes. And so if I'm understanding it, something that I have often um Let's see here. So two things that you said that are, are swirling through my head right now. 
one, for example, the that you gave as far as, yes, in my last job, I increased sales by 20%, et cetera. This is to me what right. I'll often, tell me if you agree with this. I'll often tell people there's there's no bragging involved when you're just using nouns and verbs. It's when you use the adjectives and adverbs that you get in trouble. I increased sales 20% as opposed to I'm awesome because I, you know, I'm great at this because I was able to, if you give the nouns and the verbs, the stats, and somebody else deduces the conclusion that you're yeah. awesome, that's up to them. They're not going to disagree with yourself. And who are you to tell them that they're wrong? But for you to assert the I'm awesome, because that's when people are going to step back and go, yeah, I'll be the judge of that. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, now the doubt creeps into my mind because you've, you've tried to tell me what I should think. Yeah. Is that in there? So I can I can share yes very fair I can share a quick story with you yeah uh, it was it was a gentleman what what wanted, wanted to uh, kind of be part of the maybe the close school do some coaching I'm not sure exactly what it was that he was looking for from me but in any event uh, when when I got his business card uh, his title was visionary <laughs> and and I thought wow wow. You know, and I, I think I think that's really a blatant example of exactly what you're saying, mm. right? That immediately he lost credibility to me. Immediately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. So, did he qualify that at all? I, I didn't even give him the chance. So I I think <laughs> I think you know we. I said, look, I have to get a drink, and I walked away. And <laughs> He drove you to drink. That's terrible. That is yeah. not good. For everybody out there, if you are trying to interview for a job, if you drive the interviewer to drink, <laughs> that's usually a bad sign. Just my hunch. You know, don't, don't hold me to it, but I'm going to absolutely take a stab Absolute. at that one. Uh, and I think the other point that you raised is that you can say, I. this is where the you know, everything that I've been teaching is all the verbal vocal visual alignment and where that that's the foundation of credibility in your speaking. You can say I increased sales by 20%, but there's a difference between just sitting calmly in that, look, this is just a matter of fact. So it, in my last job, I increased sales by 20% over the course of, you know, 12 months or whatever it was versus, well, I increased sales 20%. Like, aren't so, so there, or you should be impressed with me because 20% is a big number. That's, it's the, how it sounds. Do you sound a little too impressed with yourself or are you just merely stating the facts? Yes. And, and I, I would also add, it can go the other way. Well, I kind of increased sales by 20%. Yes. I mean, right. You could do it. You could do it the other way. And so I think that's why you have to be comfortable in your voice, uh, comfortable in what you're saying without bragging or without, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, it sounds like either way, you don't want to brag on the one hand, but you also don't want to downplay. You don't want to downplay. You don't want to downplay exactly what, what you have done. And I think, uh, I think sometimes, unfortunately, women struggle with the, you know, we tend to downplay a little bit too much sometimes. Sure. sure. But I think, this, I think this generation is getting better. Than <laughs> we certainly are working on it yes we are. not for lack of effort that's great from there i think we are ready for the speed round and okay. these are three issues where they're frequently brought up in by clients in training and coaching even in some uh, speaking engagement contexts where people have these mindsets where well this is a black and white and we really know it's not or where they feel like they're the only ones stuck look dr de is a genius she is always academically inclined she's never made mistakes she doesn't struggle with anything that's why she's where she is i could never be like her i could never achieve what she's achieved and we want to let people know look we all have struggled with stuff we all are working on different things so they're not alone. Now, with regard to these, I'm going to ask you to give a initially a single word or a very short phrase answer on where you personally land on each of these issues, and then I'll prompt you for a little bit more a little bit more of a of an explanation afterwards. Sure. So, first, public speaking, love it or hate it? Love it. Then what's one tip that you can give to people maybe who don't love it so much for something that they can do to speak with more confidence or manage those nerves? So lots of answers here. I think you really have to have a passion for your message. If you're being asked to, to give a keynote, to be part of a panel, uh, there's a reason someone asked you. And uh, so it really is about loving your message and uh, believing in the, the best way to deliver that message. Um, and so, so it, I think the way to prepare for that is, is rehearsing. 
Mm. Just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. It's what I tell students uh, all the time when they're about to give presentations. It's, I've even told staff this, you know, if, if you're giving a presentation to someone, again, put yourself in the audience place and, and rehearse. Now, what about the introversion, extroversion continuum? Do you consider yourself more of an introvert or an extrovert? So, um, extrovert, absolutely <laughs> extrovert. I uh, get a lot of energy uh, from being with my team, from being with people. I love the interaction. It's why I think I've always loved the classroom hmm. so much ever since I was in high school and, and chose the career in education. It's that interaction, uh, it's continual learning. And I think, you know, so, so being an extrovert, you do learn. You know, you're always learning from people, you're engaging with people. Um, it's, it's very inspirational for me. Then what's a strength that you take as an extrovert? What's something you're inherently just good at or comfortable with? And what's an area that you recognize you need to work on as an extrovert? So um, the first part of the question, mm -hmm. uh, I think a strength is that I basically like people. Mm -hmm. And so that's easy for me to get energy from them. It's... Um, uh, it's what I bring to the table. You know, I, I, I like people uh, and I'm comfortable with people. Okay. Um, something that I have to work on. Uh, the second part of that question, being an extrovert, is, is the downtime when there aren't people around. Mm. So, you know, COVID, uh, you know, being inside, being on Zoom all day long, I find that it's much more difficult for me to wind down at the end of the day than it is when I'm actually in person with people. And so um, I think we all need to wind down. And I find that I, being an extrovert, I don't wanna wind down. I just wanna continually engage. Yeah. And that sometimes can take its toll. Absolutely. I, I'm right there with you. I remember yeah. back in college, I was always better at studying in the cafeteria than in the library. The library was too quiet. I needed the hum of all the people around me. And uh, that, oh, then that's I interesting. get into my zone and, and do more work. So of course, that also explains why the freshman 15 hit as hard as it did. But nevertheless, <laughs> I liked that energy <laughs> of having the people around me. And then what about finally conflict? Nobody likes conflict. But when faced with yeah. a potential conflict or a difficult conversation, is your natural hard wiring to want to avoid it or to want to just address it head on? So it's actually the former. Uh, I want to avoid conflict at, at any cost, but I have learned, uh, particularly professionally, that is not the best strategy. So when I'm presented with a difference of opinion where perhaps I need to make the decision, where there's conflict, uh, when someone is talking to me and I'm not agreeing, and I know this is, you know, I, what I try to do is to uh, pause. So I won't respond because I'm thinking and I'm processing. And I think the important thing that I've learned is that when people are talking to me and I'm not responding is to explain that lack of initial response. So I will always say, I'm processing this. Give me 10 seconds to process this before we continue this conversation, before we talk more on this point. So yes, I, I, if I could avoid conflict at all costs, I would, but I know that I can't. So the way that I deal with it is to respectfully walk it through with the other person, um, uh, and do the pause, but explain the pause so they don't think that you're blowing them off. <laughs> yes, yes. Explaining intention, always a, good, uh, always a good strategy to avoid miscommunication. So with that then, Dr. Donna DeCarolis, how can people learn more about you and your organization? So I would encourage, uh, I, I want to end by saying that our tagline is entrepreneurship education empowers everyone. Mm. We truly believe that. And I would encourage uh, the audience to go to our site, you know, drexel.edu slash close 
to perhaps visit my webpage, drdcarolis.com, follow the Close School on Instagram and Facebook. All our messages about the power of education and the entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship are certainly there. And we will, of course, have all of those links in our show notes. So if you didn't have a chance to write it down, if you're driving, for those of you who are in cars nowadays, once again, then we'll make sure we've got it for you later on when you are ready to take a look. Dr. DeCarlis, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Thank you, Laura. It's been a pleasure. And for everybody else out there, thank you once again for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.